evening. We know that our sun is one of 100,000 million stars in our galaxy. But our galaxy is not the only one. There are untold millions of others, and they're of different shapes. Some are spirals, like Catherine wheels. Some are elongated. Some are spherical. Some are totally irregular. And astronomers are very keen to know how many galaxies there are of which types. But of course, there are so many galaxies that one team can't possibly do it. And therefore, why not bring in the amateurs? After all, astronomy is still about the only science where amateurs can and do play a very useful part. And our own Chris Lintock came up with the uh, what he called Galaxy Zoo. With us, Dr. Kate Land and Professor Bob Nickel. Well, Chris, you started all this. What is, it, is Galaxy Zoo? Well, it was a simple solution to the difficult problem that we've got too much data to play with. In the old days, astronomers thought themselves lucky if they looked at 30 galaxies in their career, and you made a very detailed study of those 30 galaxies, and you hoped to learn something about the universe from those. These days, as you said in your introduction, we have literally hundreds of thousands of the things. No astronomer can possibly sort through them all, so we need to find new ways of looking at our data. The problem is that we still want to care about each and every galaxy individually. They've all got their own stories, and they've all been seen by modern surveys, particularly the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which, Bob, you took a lead part in producing. What exactly is the Sloan? The Sloan Digital Sky Survey was the first digital map of the northern sky. So about the mid-80s, we were starting to get these little CCD cameras, which now every yes, amateur yes, has a CCD indeed. camera. And everyone but has, it's in a digital camera. Exactly, it's camera. in your mobile phone, right? And so, uh, but in the mid-80s, these were new technology, and people were starting to put them at the back of, of telescopes yes, and, and take photographs with these digital cameras. And they thought, well, what if we mosaic a bunch of these CCDs together, we can have you know a very big camera, and we can potentially digitize the whole northern sky. And, you know, I'm proud to say that 20 years later, we've done that. So there is now a, a map, a digital map of the whole northern sky. How many galaxies, roughly? Well, there's about 200 million objects mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the catalog, of which half of those are galaxies. So there's about 100 million galaxies. That's that a number. Are, yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. And also, of course, in these pictures, you can see the shapes. Absolutely. Absolutely. So for these brightest million, which we now have distances for, we can also, the resolution of the telescope is good enough that you can see the shape. And there's actually a tremendous amount of information in the pictures. And that's one thing that this automated Sloan couldn't do, right? It could not take those pictures yeah. and say, ooh, there's a disk, there's a bulge. That's just something, actually, a computer can't do right now. What about the spin of the galaxy? Are they clockwise or anticlockwise? Well, we know you get a bit of both. Spiral galaxies are rotating, and we can tell that by the arms. So you've got these nice swirling arms, and they generally trail the direction of the rotation. So if the spiral kind of spirals clockwise, it means it's turning anticlockwise. So we can look at the arms and tell which way the galaxy is rotating, and you get a lot rotating clockwise and a lot rotating anticlockwise. Obviously, that depends which side of the galaxy you're sitting on. So it's not an inherent property of the galaxy. It's well, just the way we're observing it. Well, Chris, you still haven't said again what galaxy zoo is. And That's right, we got distracted. About it. We were talking about the problem. So hopefully we're giving you the idea that the understanding the shapes of these galaxies is important. It's the key to, to yes. unlocking their history and, and how they came to be where yep. they are now. Uh, Bob said that computers aren't that good at doing this. You get, they get most of them right, but they, they miss the weird and the wonderful, the unusual ones that tell you about what's really going on. Well, so the, those. the only way to do this is to look at them. And amateurs have always done astronomy. They've discovered comets, supernovae, monitored the planets, explored the sky. But you've needed a telescope and a dark site to do some of that. What we did was we took the Sloan images, which the collaboration had made available to anyone, and we created a website, galaxyzoo.org, which showed people some of these images, taught them what we were looking for. And just, we were just asking some question, is it a spiral galaxy with spiral arms and a disk, or is it an elliptical, a big ball of stars? How many people took part in your initial survey? <laughs> many more than we thought <laughs> uh, would. Within 24 hours of launching, we were doing 70,000 classifications an hour. We're seeing spirals, ellipticals, Azor and galaxies, but there are other things too. Some rather weird things. Oh, some wonderfully weird things. Um, 
it's not something we thought of when we launched this, or at least I didn't. Okay, I don't know, or Bob, I don't know if you knew this would be a side well, effect. Well, every time you look in a in a haystack, you find a couple of needles. So right, and people told us about the needles, particularly through the Galaxy Zoo forum, mm. where there's a which is a discussion board that we set up. They talk to each other and they discuss the weird things they find. And sometimes they're just fun. There's the penguin galaxy, for example, yes. which is, is rather good. There's uh, lots that look like flowers. There's right. a whole okay. thread of galaxy images that look like roses. Or the alphabet, so we oh, can the write alphabet. the sky at night yeah. in galaxies <laughs> if we want to. So that's fun, but then there's some serious science. Um, the classic example is an object that we've come to call the Vorver. Well, you showed that to me and I, I saw it through it there. What it was, I just didn't know. No, and it was a Dutch school teacher, Hanny van Arkel, who found this. And she appeared on the forum and said, what's this? And a bunch of astronomers, us, the people, the team behind the site, said, well, we don't know. We thought about it for a bit. And eventually we had friends using a telescope in the Canary Islands, the William Herschel telescope. We got a spectrum of it. So we found that this object, it's about galaxy size. It's a small galaxy. It's about the size of a dwarf galaxy. But it's only gas. It doesn't seem to have any stars in it. How far away? Um, it's about 600 million light years. Nothing spectacular by astronomical standards. But the point is it's got no stars in it, but it's very hot. The gas is at least 10,000 Kelvin. So the question is, how did the gas get to be so hot if there aren't any stars there to heat it? Well, the discoverer, Hanny van Arkel, actually came here to talk to me about it. I actually had to classify the galaxy next to it, next to the strange thing I found. Um, so I, I quickly classified that and then I thought, wait, what was that? And um, I clicked the back button and I saw this strange blue um, sort of cloud. And it caught my eye because it was very blue and it had a strange form. And it was nothing like the, the irregular galaxies I'd seen, but um, I didn't think it was very uh, special either, but I was just wondering what it was. Well, very sensibly, you notified others, and what did they say? Um, yeah, I posted it on the, on the Galaxy Zoo forum, and I mailed the, the zookeepers, the team, and um, all of them were just saying that it was weird and looked interesting, and nobody really had an answer. Honey, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Well, Chris, that's the follow-up. What's happening about it now? We're waiting for next month when the astronauts will go up to the Hubble Space Telescope and repair it for us. And when they do, one of the first objects in the queue will be the Volva. We got approval for seven orbits of Hubble time, that's how we measure these things, to look at this object. And I'm really excited. It's the first time I've succeeded in using the Hubble Space Telescope, so that'll be great. We also want to look in the radio and the infrared to see if there's a black hole hidden at the centre of the neighbouring galaxy that is active but just hidden. Now we've been surveying for some time, what do you think are the most important results from Galaxy Zoo so far? There's been this ex extremely long-standing problem in, uh, in extragalactic astronomy, and that is, as you, as you pointed out at the beginning, there, there seems to be two types of galaxies, right? right? There's the, the elliptical and there's the spiral. Yes, and, uh, and we've known that ellipticals like to live together. They like to live in clusters of galaxies, yes. which we call sort of star cities. Whereas the spirals tend to like to live in the outskirts, maybe in the suburbs of these, these big uh, sort of galaxy cities. But no one's put their finger on why. What is actually going on? Why do all the ellipticals live together? Why do all the spirals live sort of on the outskirts? There's clearly some environmental dependence going on here, but no one's really worked out what it is. So when uh, Chris mentioned this to me, I sort of suddenly saw the, the opportunity here to look at it in much, much greater detail. Because as Chris alluded to, uh, as professionals, we've been unable to build the big samples. We've been able, unable to get lots of galaxies right. where we know there's a spiral, we know it's an elliptical. But what's emerged are two new types of galaxies that we you know, didn't predict, I think. And that is we are finding blue ellipticals, so they have the shape of an elliptical galaxy, mm. but their colours are bluer than their colleagues. And we're finding red spirals, so we're finding things that certainly have spiral arms, so they've got old stars in. And so that's a great result. We were you know, jumping up and down when we discovered that. And we've actually discovered 10,000 mm. of these red spirals. And many more blue ellipticals And many, as many well. more blue ellipticals. But the absolutely fascinating thing that we discovered is that as you went into these clusters, the number of red spirals, so the number of these things that have spiral arms but don't have the colours of other spirals, the number of those increase. 
And what you can, you can say definitively is these red spirals live in clusters. They don't live in the outskirts. They are mostly in the clusters. I had to go to where I'm, I'm an observer of the moon. I don't do anything about galaxies mm. at all. But I've thoroughly enjoyed doing it. And you'll get to carry on then. Absolutely. We've, got, we've yeah. got plans in place for at least the next three years. And we've got plenty of work for 160,000 yeah. people and many more. Well, so they'll come back before very long and tell us what the latest results are. And congratulations to you, Chris, for starting it and to you for carrying it on. So it's a great business. Well, now, we've been talking about galaxies. You can see some with small telescopes or even binoculars. And outside my observatory, Pete Norris is there to have a look at some of them. As we head into September, there are some fantastic galaxies on view. And we have the virtue of having one of the brightest in the entire night sky, M31, the Andromeda Galaxy, a beautiful spiral galaxy in the constellation of Andromeda. Now we can find M31 quite easily. We can use an old friend, which is the Great Square of Pegasus. At this time of year, the Great Square of Pegasus is rising in the hours before midnight in the east. So it's fairly easy to find. If we can locate the Great Square, locate the two stars at the top of the square and extend them to the left by about the same distance as the square side. Go up slightly from that point and you'll come to another star which is about the same brightness as the stars in the Great Square. And this is Beta Andromedae and it's a key star for finding the galaxies which I shall be talking about in a moment. Now if you turn 90 degrees going up from Beta Andromedae you'll come to a fainter star which is known as Mu Andromedae. Keep going up again and you'll come to another star which is even fainter still which is New Andromedae. And if you can find New Andromedae the galaxy M31 is just above that. To the naked eye in dark skies it looks very obvious. It's an elongated smudge of light. In fact it's a bit of a tease but I'll come back to why that's the case in just a moment. If you've got a pair of binoculars or a telescope using a low power if you look at M31 you actually get three galaxies for the price of one because very close to the core of M31 there are two elliptical galaxies which are actually satellites of M31 itself. They're actually in orbit around the core of M31. Now these two elliptical galaxies actually look slightly different to one another. If you can locate the one which is due south, it's about a third of a degree due south of the centre of M31, that's known as M32. It's quite bright and if you look at it with a telescope you start increasing the power you'll see that it looks just like a ball of stars. It looks like a fuzzy star actually. The other one is NGC 205 and to find NGC 205 you have to go from M32 through the centre of the core and up and slightly to the right. A little bit further out this time, about half a degree, again an elliptical galaxy, but this time it's actually slightly elongated. To see a spiral galaxy in its full glory, we need to find one which is more or less face on to us. And fortunately, there is one very close by. In fact, if we go back to M31, join a line from M31 to Beta Andromedae, this is the star we found earlier, and then extend it for the same distance again, going downwards this time, the end point of that line marks the position of another famous spiral galaxy, M33, in the constellation of Triangulum, the Triangle. In fact, it's known as the Triangulum Galaxy. Now, this is a wonderful object, but if you look at it with a telescope, using a reasonable magnification, you probably won't see anything at all. It's large and it has a low surface brightness. What happens is you're looking right through the galaxy. What you need to do to see it is to use a low power, and that's a pair of binoculars is ideal, or a low power eyepiece. If you do this, you'll be able to see that it has an elongated smudgy appearance, but if you keep staring at it, you may be able to see the structure start to form in those spiral arms. You may be able to pick it out. It looks like some sort of fantastic celestial Catherine wheel, if you like. Now M33, M31 and its two companion elliptical galaxies are going to be up for several months yet. So if you have a telescope, a pair of binoculars or even just your eyes, 
go outside and look at these fantastic objects. They're just wonderful. Well, that's good advice. Uh, back indoors and we are joined by Martin Mobley. Now, on August the 1st, we had an eclipse of the sun. It was only a small partial eclipse here. I did take a picture of it, but not very spectacular. But Martin was in the track of Tetheris. So, Martin, can you tell us where you were and what you saw? Well, Patrick, I'm sure you'll agree that total solar eclipses are just about the most awesome spectacle that you can possibly see. Uh, for this particular eclipse, I was in a place called Novosibirsk, which is Russia's third largest city, not far from the Russia-Chinese border. And we had a spectacular two minutes, 19 seconds of totality. Which, I'm green with envy. Well, the trouble with all these eclipses is they're spectacular, they're awesome, yeah. but the time just flies by. The two no. minutes, 19 seconds, it just seems like about 30 seconds, and you wonder where the time went. But the most dramatic pictures I've seen of this eclipse were by the the master, the undisputed master of coronal imaging, Miloslav Druckmuller, who's from the University of Technology in Brno. This Czech is Republic. incredible, this picture. And, and his pictures are just awesome. He takes uh, about 20 pictures of various exposures, combines them, and uh, this is a sort of spectacular result he gets. Well, I envy you. I would like to there's another eclipse next year, another society. You will see it, so will you, Chris. Very sadly, I shan't. Thank you, Martin. Thank you. Now, on our other news notes, uh, Phoenix on Mars. They've been doing great things. Yes, we're just at the end of the third month of its time on Mars, and it's been working very hard indeed. Firstly, to get samples from the soil into its ovens, an instrument called TIGA, which can then heat them, and we can look at the chemical composition of the Martian soil. Phoenix has got three very important samples already into its ovens. It's had one from the surface, one from the ice layer they discovered just five centimetres underneath that surface, and now in the last month, one from just in between. So we have a good sense of how the properties of the Martian soil change in this exotic location. Phoenix also has a microscope, uh, half of the MECA package. They've been taking a close look at the soil and also using something called an atomic force yes. microscope to get very detailed images of individual Martian dust grains. So observers have always seen dust on Mars. You see dust storms. We've seen dust devils from the rovers. Well, now we can see the dust grains themselves, and that's a fantastic result. They've been looking at the chemistry of the soil too. Yes. Here the results are confusing. We've known for the last couple of months that the soil is alkaline, but it turns out the chemistry is more complicated than that. We've been told that there are chemicals called perchlorates there. It doesn't matter what a perchlorate is, I wouldn't recognise one if it hit me, but the point is the, it, it's a complicated chemistry, so it's going to take some time to understand those results. And time is something that Phoenix doesn't have. No. It's been in the Martian Arctic, so it's had midnight sun until now, but just a week ago there was the first sunset as seen from Phoenix. There's an amazing image of it, but that means that Phoenix, which depends on solar power, is going to be able to do less and less. They've got about a month of good, hard-working robotic arm time left. So the team will want to make the best use of that time because they're seeing frost forming on the surface overnight already. Eventually that frost will cover the lander and Phoenix won't survive the Martian winter. No, I fear Phoenix cannot survive through the Martian night. But of course, we'll keep everyone up to date. Chris, Martin, thank you very much. When I come back next month, we'll talk about the autumn sky and join in an autumnal equinox star party. Until then, good night. <laughs>